So my name is Ovid. I'm a senior software engineer for Red Hat. And today I'm going to talk about scripting and integration with Overt. So the agenda will be as follows. I'll start with a small Overt introduction, just in case you, you, you don't know the project or you, you didn't use the project before. And then I'm going to divide this session into two parts. The first one, we'll, we'll talk about the REST-based APIs that we have in the Overt engine. I'll start with an introduction to that. Then I'm going to show the three types of APIs we have, the regular API, the, the shell command, the, the Overt shell, which is the CLI. I'll show some demo of that. And the SDK. Then I'm going to briefly talk about Delta Cloud APIs and how they can be used also with the Overt engine. Now, that part is, is basically uh, the, the, the basics for the second part, in which we'll talk about how we can extend the functionality of the, the Overt engine and, and modify its behavior um, in different fields using UI plugins to change the UI, scheduling uh, APIs or scheduling plugins in order to change the way Overt uh, schedules uh, VMs in, in its environment and VDSM hooks. Now, the first two UI plugins and scheduling API are also, uh, you, you, you would basically use them uh, in addition to using, um, sorry, in addition to using the over the SDK, for example, in order to do different operations. So that's why I divided it into these two sections. I'll just start and say that there are a few ses sessions tomorrow regarding over it. One of them is a, a session by Omer Frankel that uh, talk, talks about another type of integration we have with cloud in it, integration with cloud in it. Omer is <laughs> sitting over here. Um, and we have an over developer day at the KVM forum in which we plan to discuss different, uh, different issues. It's, it's practically a stage for us to say what we're, how we see the product uh, in the future and, and, and the stage for you to say what you want to see in it. I, I guess there will be many open discussions over there in different issues, so you will have uh, the opportunity to share your thoughts about uh, about the project and what you want to see in it. So uh, I recommend uh, going there. I also have here some uh, uh, USB on a stick of so over it. Uh, you can feel free to take them uh, when the session ends. Uh, if you will be bad participants, I might throw it uh, at you. So. Uh, and it's an intimate session, so you can feel free to, to move forward or something. But um, So are you familiar with Overt, everyone here? Who isn't familiar? Okay, so basically Overt is, is, is a large-scale centralized management uh, environment for desktop and server virtualization. Basically, it gives you a way to manage your data center based on leading performance, scalability, and security technologies. It's based on KVM in its, in its uh, uh, main backend. And it basically provides an open source alternative to vSphere or, or vCenter if you got a chance to, to work with this product. Um, a very powerful product, a large community behind it. Many companies also contribute to the project. Uh, we have a Fedora release, and then uh, um, we take this release and also release Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization as a product. But today we, we came here only to discuss the, the Overt project. Um, so that basically the project is solved. So we'll start with the REST-based API. Uh, I guess some of you or many people here are familiar with REST, but I'll give some, some basics about that as well. So when looking at Overt, what can we do with, with, with the REST API? So basically we can do infrastructure configuration to configure hosts configure networks, configure storage in the system, create, provision new virtual machines, manage users, do different daily maintenance that we need to do in our environment. We can do basically anything that can be done with the Overt Engine through the API. Some options, some operations are, are exposed through the API, but they aren't even exposed through the UI because maybe because the flow doesn't make sense to put them there, but, but if you work with the API, you can do everything and beyond what can, what can be done in the UI. So where you should use it? You probably use it in scripting and utilities. If you have another software you're writing and you want to integrate it with the Overt Engine, if you want to do some task automation in your system, 
provision and new virtual machines, manage new virtual machines. Um, you want to, to do some add-on, uh, performance monitoring of your environment, reports. The offered project contains reports, but you can also uh, uh, integrate with it and you can um, generate reports of your own. And, and as I said earlier, in the second part of the session, I'll show you some other use cases where you can use that. So for now, we, we expose three types of, of three ways for you to, to, to use the API. One of them is use, using the REST API itself. Uh, um, um, the other one is using an SDK. And the third one is just to use a shell. Now the, the SDK is based on the REST API and the shell is based on the SDK, uh, the Python SDK in, in this uh, example. So basically you have three ways you can use the API. Now the question is what method you should use and, and that's de that depends highly on who you are, what you want to do, what's your role in the organization you work with. For example, if you're a sysadmin that has a, a, a small environment and you would like to, tr to do some troubleshooting and you don't want to open the UI and to wait, and sysadmin, like, they just love CLI. I was a sysadmin once, so I know I just, oh, now open the browser and stuff like that. So I just want to, to, to have a look and view a, a few things. So you can just use the shell in order to, to run some operations, to run some, to, to, to view some stuff. If you're a data center admin, managing a larger environment, and perhaps you, you can get lost in the CLI, so you would, uh, you would probably want to, to make some predefined scripts uh, um, that, that, that fit you best. So you, perhaps you would use the SDK in order to do that. Um, and if you're a software developer running in a specific environment where you don't have really an SDK, uh, then you can just use the REST API natively using the HTTP HTTP clients that are available in your environment. So it highly depends on, on, on who you are, what's your level of expertise, and what you're trying to do. The concepts of the API, and, and when I say API, here I mean all, all the types of APIs, is that they are all integrated through the Overit engine. And they are all based on the REST as a core, SDA on top of it, and the shell on top of that, as I said earlier. Another thing that's very important for us is backward and forward compatibility, so we would be able to use the current API with uh, uh, the, the current SDK, the current uh, shell, uh, with uh, um, older versions of the Overt engine, and also use older, old, older SDK with newer versions. We, we try, we sometimes break that, but we usually try to keep it as compatible as possible to leave all the options available. And if we're deprecating them, it takes a few versions until they get uh, deprecated. We give secure access to the API. You need to supply credentials in order to use the API. And another thing we added, I think about a year ago, is uh, session-based access. And we'll talk about that later on. So the API, it's a REST API. Uh, are you familiar with REST? Okay, so if not, it, it, it's practically built uh, of four building blocks, in my opinion, uh, uh, four different HTTP methods that you use. One of them is get in order to get a resource. One of them is post in order to create a new resource in a collection. One of them is put in order to modify the resource and delete in order to delete the resource. Just as simple as that. Usually, it supports two different media types, XML and JSON. And we support that as well. And when we're looking at the structure of, of, of a generic REST, and, and specifically in our environment, you have the, the protocol you're using, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, the server and the port, the, basically the endpoint you're using, the API, which is the entry point for all the REST API. And then afterwards, you have a collection. In, in, in this example, it's the VMs collection. Then a resource inside this collection, a subcollection. VM has disks, so the disks are a subcollection at the VM uh, inside the specific VM. And there you can access a specific disk. And it can go on according to the collections and subcollections you have. So th that's the structure of the URI. 
Um, it's usually like that in REST applications. You have a collection, a resource, a sub-collection, a resource in that, uh, and, and that's practically it. And as a result, you, you, you get the resource. In here, I put it in, in XML format. So you have the metadata of the resource, the details on the resource. In here is the VM, so the name of the VM, the status of the VM, memory, CPUs, when it was started, and et cetera. And the actions that are available on this resource, on this VM, and links to other resources. For example, the VM, uh, the VM, for example, has disks, so you can access the specific disks of this, of this VM, so it's a link to another resource. Or the NICs of the VM, uh, the cluster that the, the VM is part of, and et cetera. So that's the way it's divided. I'll just say that the actions in here are not uh, uh, related in any way to the status of the VM. I saw that specifically Delta Cloud and other projects as well, uh, you show you the actions you can actually do on the resource in its current status. So it's not the fact. In here, in here we show you all the actions that can be done on the resource uh, uh, at specific times, but perhaps you know you, you try to stop a VM that's not running, so we tell you it's not running. Just a note about that. So in order to list uh, uh, the VMs, you, you just do a get on the VMs collection. If you want to get a specific one, you, you also use HTTP get with a specific um, ID. Create a new VM using post giving the VM details. Updating in here, in here we rename the VM, so we just pass the new name of the VM. And in order to delete it, we just do HTTP delete and give the resource ID, the, the resource itself, the URI to the resource. Are there any questions? I mean, it's basic stuff, but perhaps something is not clear, so I'll be happy to. Yeah, well, so uh, uh, can you also use the API to manage the OBIT node, the, the DDSM stuff, or, or it may apply to the VM uh, and their. No. So basically, a, a, a VDSM is a host in the overhead engine. So you can use, uh, so we have a collection of hosts and you can do different operations on hosts. Now, th that depends on what do you want to manage inside the, the VDSM node. I mean, we, we, we give you the way to add new hosts which will install VDSM on them and to delete them and to modify different properties of the host. But perhaps, but, but we don't expose in the overhead engine every configuration that can be done on the host. We, we just configure that for you in a way. We try to put everything in the engine and free configuration that's relevant for you as a user, but perhaps you would, you would want to hack that for one reason or another. So, yeah, but, but when you will access API slash host, you will see the host the Overit engine is aware of, and you will be able to do different operations. I'll show you in a second how you can easily know what you can do with a specific resource. So there are different, I won't get deeply into that, but there are different clients you can use in order to, to, to run these HTTP commands, uh, different cl REST clients that, that are available in the different browsers, or command lines utility like curl, for example. This is just an example using curl uh, to get a specific VM, so uh, in here you pass the, the username and the password, you say you want to get an, an XML, you say the HTTP method is get, and you give the URL of the, of the specific VM you want to use. If you want to create a VM, you need to do HTTP post, and the, the three parameters needed, to, the, the, the minimum parameters needed to, that you need to supply in here is the name of the VM, the cluster that the VM will reside on, and the template the VM is created from. So you would just, uh, uh, also use curl with the minus D option and give the body of the VM you want to use. It's very standard use of, of, of REST API in here to update the VM, to rename it. So you just use the minus T option with curl, giving it the, 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 thing you, the, the, the properties you would like to change in the VM. And in order to delete, you issue the delete 
the delete command, give it minus x delete. Now, it's a bit hard to understand what you can and can't do with a specific resource in, this, in the environment. It's, it's, it's a common problem for REST in general because uh, you don't really know what's exposed. You don't really know what is mandatory to pass when you create a new resource. You don't really know what you can modify in the resource. So for that reason, we created something we call RSDL, which is a RESTful Services Description Language. Um, I didn't see it use, being used in other projects, but I think it's a very, it was a very good idea to do that, and I'll, I'll show you in a second uh, an example for that. So, um, so basically, it, it describes the parameter constraints that you have using the REST API, and basically, it helps you understand how can you create a resource, how, what actions are available on a specific collection, uh, what parameters do you need to pass, which one is mandatory, which one is optional, which ones you can't really change, they're read-only. Um, and the best way is just to show you an example. So in here you see I, I access the overt API. Do you see well the screen, everyone? Okay. And the question mark, RSDL. So let's assume I would like to know what I can do with the VMs collection. So let's look for slash API slash VMs. Okay, so I got this one. Okay, so I see that if I, would, if I want to add a new VM to the collection, I need to use the HTTP method, that, the, the post HTTP method. In the headers, I need to supply the content type. Um, it, it's a required field. There are two additional fields here fields here that are uh, optional. And when I get to the body, I know that I need to pass a VM object and different parameters. So I see that the VM name is required. The template that the VM is created from is also required. Either the ID or the name of the template. The cluster is required. And I have a lot of other options here that, uh, that are, that are uh, optional. Okay, I see the type of the parameter I want to use. I need to use, and, and that's basically it. So I can, I can just look at that and understand what I can do. I can parse that in order if I want to create some client of mine that, that can do different operations. If I want to create a, a fancy UI, so I'll, I'll just show the different options to the user. Uh, and basically, it's a very powerful thing because it describes you the API, and each time we do a change in the API, it also updates this one. So you, it, for every over it engine you use, you can you, you know exactly what you can and can't do with it, and, and uh, uh, it's a very power, powerful thing. Now, if we look, we saw here the add operation. Let's drill down to. There are a lot of options when creating a VM. Uh, so let's go to, let's write method uh, post, not method, sorry. So, so, slash API, slash VMs. Let's drill down to next one. Okay, so I see that if I need to get to get the VM, all I need to do is use the HTTP method get. I see here the, he the header uh, parameters that are uh, in here, no nothing is mandatory. I just have um, a parameter here which is optional. Um, I can do different search queries in order uh, to get more specific details. Delete, I see that in order to delete, I need to use HTTP delete, delete on this resource. And I guess I will have put next somewhere here. If I would like to update a VM, I need to use the uh, entity, the specific VM entity in the URI. And I also have here a list of all the options I can pass. When updating, nothing is really mandatory. You can update everything. You can do no update. That, depends on you. 
So, so that, I think it's a very powerful thing, depending again on what you would like to accomplish. So uh, that's the RSDL. And here you see an example. I've uploaded the slides, by the way. I changed them a bit, but if you access the, the website, I guess you can download them and have it available. And so, so I will skip slides here and there, but all the examples are there. So, uh, an additional functionality we have in the API that was added about, I think, a year ago. Uh, one of them is a user level API. At first, we only have admin API. In order to access the API, we needed to have admin permissions uh, in the Overt Engine. I won't go over what admin permission means and how it's created in the Overt Engine, but basically, you needed to be an administrator. And now we also support user level API. Uh, it's just, uh, in order to do that, we just added a new HTTP parameter that says that you would like to work with a filtered view uh, because users uh, uh, are only able to see specific objects and not all of them. Administrators, by, by definition in our environment, can, you, can view anything. They, they can't do anything, but they can view anything. And also session support. Um, there is some overhead in the REST uh, calls because each time we, we need to authenticate the user um, and to check uh, for LDAP credentials and verify that. So we, added a, we used cookies in order to create a session, basically, um, that you log in at the beginning and then you can do different operations and then log out at the end. There are more details about that in a wiki page. Um, uh, just um, nice to know that it's available. Are there any questions uh, so far? Okay, so let's move to the shell. We basically the, the concepts that 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 we 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 did the shell uh, with are to make it interactive, to make it as easy as possible to use with auto completion using arrow keys in order to do everything you, you're familiar with with any other shell to pipe commands in it and stuff like that. We also have help, uh, which is smart help. Basically, you can get an help on, on a specific command, on a, a, a command on a sub-collection, or command on a, on a collection. Uh, you can just do help and see all the commands you can do. Um, let's skip to, to, to just show some demo of that. So let's disconnect. I'm gonna, let's, I have one that's disconnected. Yeah. So that, that's the over shell. I just run over shell. And, uh, and I see it's a bit cut on the left. I apologize on that. I, wasn't, uh, I didn't have enough time to, to try and fix that. Basically, I see that I'm disconnected. Then um, I'm issuing the connect command. And uh, um, if I do a, a double tab, I see the different options. I need to supply the username, the password, the URL, yeah, sorry, and that's basically it. And then, and now I'm connected to the over shell. Now I can do list hosts. I can see the different hosts in my environment. I see the ID and the name. Sorry again that it's a bit cut. I see the ID of, and the name and of each of each host entity, and then I can choose to do show host um, host one. Then I see different details uh, on this specific host. Um, I can use my environment is not very uh, live at, at the moment, so I, don't, I won't do a, a lot of uh, different uh, operations in here. Uh, what I can show you is, is like um, help uh, action, for example. Okay, so I, I see the different. Let's try. Uh, not too much. I see that when I need to do some action, I see that, that I need to supply the type of the object I want to operate on, the name of the object, and the action I would like to do. Um, Let's, for example, help action uh, uh, VM. 
let's give a name of the VM and start. Okay, let's see. Oh, I didn't do this. So for a specific VM, I can migrate, I can move it, I can stop it, suspend it, export it, shut it down, etc. I see all the, all the different operations I can do. Again, it's not related to the status of the, the, the current status of the VM, but uh, it shows you all the operations that you could have done with it uh, in, in different uh, uh, lifetime um, options. Um, I can do I can try to do action via workshop start. It will probably fail because my uh, my environment is not uh, is is not alive at the moment. But th that's the way I can do different operations. I can delete the VM. I can uh, uh, show the VM details. Show VM workshop. And I have the different details. So you can basically do through the shell anything you could do with the API, anything you could do with the SDK. It's all the same thing. It all leads to the same functionality. If you found out that something that you can do in the API, you can do with the shell. Open a bug, it will fix that. It's not, uh, it's not by design. If I remember correctly, the shell uses a, a automatically um, a REST session. So you have a session. You don't uh, re-log in every time. Uh, so it's more performant. I know some people are against using the word session with the word rest because it's a, it's a, it has some contradiction. But we don't really save anything in the session besides the, the fact that you can do operations. It has no state. Um, so when you ask for a resource, you ask for the resource and you get the current resource. It's not cached everywhere. It's not saved every, uh, anywhere. So, in the, so the session in here is only in order to be more performant. Okay, I have some more examples in the slides. You can ask for a specific, uh, if you list a specific resource, list VMs, for example, a specific collection, you can choose to show all the properties. Um, you can filter them out using uh, either a query at the client side, that means that the, SD, the, the CLI gets all the information and, and it does the filtering in the client or to send a query to the overt engine to filter some, uh, some, to filter some objects out, depending on what exactly you would like to do. You can add, update, or remove a resource. I saw some, some help example. Again, if I would like to, to install a new host, for example, as you asked, so I did action host Atlantic install and give the root password, which is the only parameter I need to, to pass that. When I will use the, the CLI, it will show me what parameters are available for that operation. If I'll use the help, I'll also see further details about each parameter. Uh, so it's very convenient. Um, in here, we added a new VM based on the blank template, and we put them in the default cluster. We updated the OS type of the VM. We added a new NIC to the VM. So we said add NIC. The VM identifier is this. The name of the NIC is this. And the network I want to create the NIC in is this. It's just as simple as that. In here, we see an example to create a new disk. Again, passing all the parameters and then uh, attaching the disk to the VM. Originally, disks were not a, a main collection, so we, had, we, we all, always had disks inside VMs. And now disks are also a, a collection of its own, so you can create a disk and attach it later on. We decided to do the attachment also using a create command. Um, although it doesn't really create a resource, it just connects uh, an existing resource to a sub-collection of the VM. Here we saw, we see how to create a template, create template, what's the VM name you want to create the template from, and what's the name of the template, and when the template is created, we can create a VM from it. Uh, again, I, I, there are endless examples, uh, just wanted to give you some basics on what you can do with that. Are there any questions? Problem with, with the engine itself? 
Yeah, for, uh, for, for example, if the database is down, can I still log in? I guess that if the database will be down, you, you won't be logged in. I mean, it's, you can debug problems that are uh, uh, and problems with your host and with your different resources, but you but not infrastructure issues. So what you're describing is an infrastructure issue, so it so it will probably make the engine unavailable. So you can't really debug that. But if there is a problem with one of your hosts or your storage domain, then you can use the, the CLI in order to ask, show me the storage domain, and you see the storage domain is in down state uh, or inactive, stuff like that. You see if someone, I don't know, calls you and says that the VM is down, can you check it out? So you can uh, use the CLI in order to do it quickly instead of going to, into the uh, uh, management portal and, and checking that. So, okay. But not, if you have an infrastructure issue with the engine itself, then, then most of the times the API won't help. Uh, you have something to add on that, Omer? Okay, so let's move to the third section of the first section. Um, um, I, I promise that the second sec the second section of of the session is is more interesting than that. We have a lot of technical details here, but it's the building blocks for later on. So, uh, so the SDK is mainly used for integration or automation, advanced automation in that case. It's object-oriented. We currently have two bindings for that, the Java and the Python one. Uh, as I said earlier, the CLI is based on the Python one. The Python one was the first uh, binding we had. There are a few uh, other projects that created uh, different bindings or different wrappers for the REST API. One of them is G-Object Wrapper, libgovert, and the other one is uh, rbovert, which created a Ruby binding. I'm not sure how, I know that RB over it is not a complete uh, uh, binding for the API. Uh, I'm not sure about libg over it. You can, I have the links in here. You can browse and, and have a look if it's interesting for you in your environment. Uh, the examples I'll show here is for the Python SDK. The Java SDK is pretty simple, you know, similar, you know, j just in Java. There are some examples also in our website. Um, so again, the concepts up to, uh, are, to, how are to have a complete protocol abstraction, just like the CLI, just like the API, full compliance with the Overt API. Um, Auto-completion is more a feature you know, of your development environment, but you, you, uh, you can use that. It's very intuitive to use. It's auto-generated, so once we have a new change to the API, if we do it properly, it will propagate from the engine to the API, to the SDK, the, the Python SDK, the Java SDK, the CLI, everything will be updated. Uh, I can't say that for RB over it and libg over it because they are different libraries, but for the Java and for the Python SDK, it's, auto, it's completely auto-generated. So in Python, we, when we want to, to start working with the engine, we create a proxy, so we pass the, uh, we create a new API object, create, uh, passing the, uh, the URL, the username and the password, and, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Now we have uh, an object in hand uh, which we can use. For example, listing the, the, all the collections, API dot, I can see, for example, I have the VMs collection. I can do API dot VMs dot something. I can add the VM, get a VM, list all the VMs and etc. very convenient to use. There are two additional options. That's, these are exactly the ones I described earlier. One of them is to have 
uh, a filtered session, a user level API. If you want, for example, to create your own user portal, uh, you can use uh, the SDK uh, with the filter option, so you, you, you will only show the user uh, objects it can, uh, it can use. Uh, and you can use persistent authentication in order to use the REST session. I can do API VMs list and pass a query saying I would like to, to, to see only this VM. Um, I can give another constraint about the, the memory. I want, I want to get only VMs that have this memory. Again, one of them is uh, using, passing the query to the engine, and the other one is doing the query on the client side. Again, depending what you would like to do, um, we have both options. You can ask to get a specific VM, and then you can start it, for example, using vm.start. Again, it's all auto-completion depending on your environment. If you prefer VI, then I can't really promise that. But anyway, um, um, you can access different properties on the VM, for example, the name of the VM, access a sub-collection. Uh, for example, I would like to add a new NIC to the VM, so I access the NIC sub-collection, press add, passing the, the, the required parameters. We'll see an example for that. Here is an example for creating a new VM. So in order to create a VM, I need to say what cluster I want the VM to be in, from what template to create that, and, and that's practically it. So I, I, can, I can pass more parameters, but these are the mandatory ones. So first of all, I get the clusters, the specific cluster I want, then I get the template I want, then I create, in, in this example, we created a new uh, uh, params.vm object, giving all these parameters and adding the memory I would like the VM to have. And then I'm accessing the VM's co collection, issuing an add action, passing the parameter uh, that I've created, and that would create a new VM resource. If I would like to create a new disk, I say what storage domain I want to, to create a VM on, uh, uh, the disk on, uh, and in here, we just say API disks add to create a new disk entity. Um, the parameters are, this is the name, this is the size, st uh, status interface, format, and etc. Once you created a new disk, you can attach it to the VM. Again, using vm.disks.add, because we add a new uh, disk resource in the VM, and passing the disk ID and saying we would like to activate it now. We support hot plugging of disks in, in Overt, so you can do that. Here is an example with Nix, getting Nix with specific interface type. And you can find more examples in our website, but just to, to basically to give you the knowledge that you could do anything with that. Anything you could do in the API, anything you could do with the CLI. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll, I'll describe Delta Cloud in a few, just a few slides. Basically, I saw you three types of APIs you can use. Uh, the Delta Cloud project uh, adds other APIs to that. Uh, are you familiar with that project? No. So basically, it's an open source Apache project that comes to abstract the, the differences between different cloud providers. It, it basically exposes a, 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 a specific three types of APIs uh, on top of, all, on top of sp all the cloud provider it supports. It, so it gives you a way to work with different cloud providers using a unified API. Um, they support three types of APIs currently. One of them is Delta Cloud API, which is their own API, and EC2 API, which is the Amazon Cloud API, and the CME API, which is the Cloud Interface, uh, Cloud Infrastructure Management Interface uh, API. Um, the later two are, are a bit, uh, uh, they're not uh, fully complete, but a lot of options are in there. So. 
basically, if you have an environment with a lot of different cloud providers or virtualization providers you use, uh, and you would like to work with a, a, a common set of APIs on top of that, then, uh, then you can use Delta Cloud. It supports Ovirt as well. Um, again, just a way to, to use a, another set of API. Um, so these are the APIs that are exposed. And inside the Delta Cloud servers, you have different drivers that knows to talk to different cloud providers. Uh, I won't go into any further details. You, if, if it interests you, if you already work with a specific environment that has support for EC2 API and would like to work with Overt as well, you can check it out and see if it fits you. Again, the, the protocol support is not complete yet. Um, I can also say that uh, it looks like uh, the project um, is not advancing now uh, as I would have expected to, 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 to proceed, I mean, but uh, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, I also have a specific blog post on that, so you can go ahead and read it. It has some examples of using Delta Cloud on top of Overt. So we're going to move to the second part of the session. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So in the second part, we're going to talk about UI plugins. Um, I'll show a demo of a plugin. I'll, I'll show some examples uh, in the slides. Um, then we're going to talk about the scheduling uh, plugins or scheduling API. And then uh, on VDSM hooks, they give you different ways in order to customize, in order to, to, to extend the functionality of the engine, um, change it to fit your needs. Uh, and again, you would probably use, you can use uh, uh, the SDK. You would usually, I guess you would use the SDK in the, in, in the UI plugins and scheduling API. Uh, but you're free to do whatever you want. So uh, I'll, I'll show some examples. I hope it will be clear. So first, UI plugins. Uh, if you're familiar with, with our UI, then great. Uh, if not, it basically consists of uh, uh, two main parts. One of them is a tree view of the different objects in my system. And the other one in here is a tab view uh, that every main entity in our uh, uh, infrastructure uh, has a main tab, data centers, clusters, hosts, networks, and uh, etc. So, what we allow to extend currently is th this section. If you want to add a new main tab to your system, if you want to add a new sub tab to the system, then uh, for a specific, in the context of a specific uh, main entity, for example, in here it's a host. You can do that. You can add new action buttons. You can add new uh, context menu items. Basically, in here we, 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 we can see everything that's possible. Custom main tab, custom action button, um, custom context menu item. They can be, a new menu item can be in both in here and in here, or only in the panel, or only in the context menu, and the custom sub tab. So basically, you, you can change the way you can add uh, things into the UI uh, we have. Uh, and we give you a set of tools in order to do that. I'll go over these tools. Basically, looking at, at the, the, the most basic plugin you, you could use, it's just an, an HTML file with a JavaScript section. Uh, the first part will contain uh, accessing the API telling I, plug, I would like the plugin API, my name is my plugin. And then I'm registering event handler functions. In this case, I registered the UI init event. The UI init event is event that's triggered when the admin portal is initialized. And every, the only thing I did here is adding a new main tab. That's the label, that's the a unique identifier and that's a URL, that's it. So basically, that would create me a new uh, main tab. 
um, that would be the label. And when I will go to this main tab, it will access the URL http foo.com. At the end, I'm telling the API, inf the, the plugin infrastructure I'm ready to, to use. So that triggers basically uh, all the different events. So that's a very basic plugin. Just add a new main tab to the system. So we have the basics in the UI plugin contains the HTML file of the plugin. That's the one we, we saw a, a second ago. And we have a plugin descriptor, which is a JSON file containing different configuration items we, we need the plugin to have. And we can override it uh, uh, we, if, if we need, if we come, if we install the plugin with a specific configuration and we would like to override it, then we can create a new file uh, uh, in order to do that. So the locations of the plugins are user share over your tension UI plugins. The configuration file is also in that directory using a JSON file. And if we want to override the configuration, it's in ETC over tension. I'll show examples. I know it's a bit uh, confusing for now, but I, I will show you. Um, I will go over the API and then I'll show some examples. So basically, what we allow you to do is to add a new main tab, to add a new sub tab. Again, sub tabs are these ones, are the tabs that are available when you. Uh, when you select a specific entity in the main tab. You can change the URL of the subtab. Again, assuming that you, you, you have a host's main tab and you go between the hosts, and each time you select another host, you want the URL of the subtab to point to another URL. For example, let's take, uh, 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 for example, uh, uh, an external application you integrate with that, that is aware of these hosts. So when you press on the host, you want to access the URL that this uh, uh, application has for this host. I'll show an example of the Foreman plugin I, I created. So Foreman, for example, uh, uh, is aware of, of both the hosts and the VMs. So if you stand on a VM then, and you want to see details that aren't available in the Overt Engine, and they are available in Foreman or in another uh, application you use, then you can set the URL of the subtop to point to that specific URL in the application you need. That way you can extend the view of uh, uh, the view the administrator sees when he logs in uh, to the admin portal. You can also set whether a tab is accessible or not. For example, there may be entities that the tab should be accessible and for example, uh, uh, others that don't according to specific properties. So you, can, you have control on that as well. You can add new action buttons. These are the buttons that, that I showed you. These are these ones. So when you add a new action button, you say uh, uh, what is the entity, what is the main entity that the action button should be uh, in. Um, uh, what's the label, what's going to happen when you press the button, um, and that would basically g give you this functionality. We also have a, a show dialog option. For example, you can have an action button that you press on it and it, happen, it, and it opens a new, uh, uh, a new dialog uh, pointing to some URL. And th these are the main uh, the, the main functions that the UI plugin API gives you. Uh, some other useful ones are, are, are ones to, that show you the, what's the logged in username and what's the user ID. If you want to do some single sign on uh, uh, solution between the web admin, uh, the, the admin portal of Overt, and the, the other application, and you need the username for that, so you, you have access to this, to this information. We have different events that the UI plugin infrastructure supports. Uh, the UI init event is the one I showed you earlier that is triggered when the admin portal is, is generated, is, is initialized. For each entity, I have a selection change event. For example, if you are in a data center main tab and you selected a different data center, 
you change the selection, the, the data center selection change event will be triggered. If you are in the VM's uh, main tab and you selected a new VM, then the VM's selection change will be triggered. So basically for each main tab, we have a, an event uh, for each selection change. Um, we'll show examples on that as well. We have a user login or logout event. If you're doing some single sign-on, uh, um, single sign-on between uh, the admin portal and a different um, application, then you would probably want to log in. When you log into the admin portal, you would like to log into the external application, and when you log out, you would want to log out from this application. Two other events that are useful in, in this scope are the REST API session acquired. That's basically the way the, API, the, way the UI plugin API gives you to modify, uh, uh, to do operations on the engine, okay? The UI, in the UI plugin, you can have, uh, uh, you, you can point to a specific URL, uh, but the fact that you're doing a UI plugin with the engine means that you, you want to affect the engine functionality. So you, you get here uh, uh, the, the UI plugin infrastructure create a REST API session for you, and it gives it to you. And then you can use it in order to manipulate uh, specific operations, to, to manipulate specific things in the engine. For example, uh, um, a nice plugin that NetApp wrote um, that allows you to create a new uh, a volume in one of their filers and use a storage domain on that. So you would have a main tab for, uh, uh, um, I don't remember if it's a main tab or an action button, but anyway, you, you say I would like to create a new, uh, a new volume and a new NetApp volume, and then it will open you uh, at the URL of the, the NetApp uh, application, and you select the different NetApp properties. Again, it's an external application. And then at the end, it creates the volume and it wants to push it into Overt as a new storage domain that you can use. So. Uh, um, so what we did here is, is we gave them the opportunity, we gave them the REST API session, and they, and they can use it in order to, do, to add the storage domain to the system. A am I clear? Is the flow clear, or? Omer? No? <laughs> is that clear, or? So it just, just gives the, pl the plugin the, the, the strength to do different operations. The other approach we could have taken is, is to give a specific operation for everything. So uh, we decided to give just access to the API, which is uh, more powerful. Uh, <coughs> I'll show an example and then I I'll move along. Um, the example I'm gonna show you here is, is uh, Less useful, I'd say, but, but more funny. Um, and then I'll show other examples as well. So in here, I log in into the Overt, uh, into the Overt engine. I hope it will work. Uh, when I stood here before the session, it worked one time, and it didn't, it didn't work one time, and it worked two times, so uh, I, I'm not sure why it happened. Um, you see here, I select, oh, it's the resolution here, it's a bit. I go to the data center main tab, I select the data center, and I do right click. In here you see I have a new button called protect my data center from alien invasion. Okay, and now I have a game. Uh, it's not a second. I have an alien invasion game that I can play and protect my data center. Now I would like to get out of here. And then it tells me, no, you need to destroy the aliens at least once. And I can tell you it's a very hard game. I tried to destroy that for a few times. And then uh, uh, eventually I just uh, decided to cheat. Okay, I win. That's the, the cheat in here. And then I can close this dialogue. So very stupid dialogue if you ask me. But it, it shows you, you, you it, in this example, you basically created a, a new action button. You showed a new dialogue. Um, over there, there was a game, and, and uh, when I cheated, it created some event. I'll show that, the code for that. So th that's, that's basically it. Um, very easy. I'll show you the code for that. It's, it's, not, uh, m most, it's, not, it's not complicated at all. What do you mean created an event? In the, in the event of 
was the uh, the Ah, no, I meant a, 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 a message. I'll show you what I meant. Just a second. Uh, so, started from. Just a second. Oh, I think I'm in another slide for some reason. Yeah, this one's the correct one. Okay. Um, no, what I, what I meant is it, it, one of the events is message received. It's a way for a, a new dialogue to switch messages between uh, the dialogue and the uh, engine uh, infrastructure. So, so uh, uh, basically, uh, what we did here is that the dialogue uh, sent a, a message to the UI plugin telling him that I won. And, and th that's what happened in here. Um, if I'll show you the code for that, again, very simple. I created an init function that adds a new main tab action button. You saw I have a new action button. Uh, the scope was a data center. I protected my data center from alien invasion. It's enabled only if one data center is selected. And when I click on that, it opens, it calls the open dialog function. Now the location I wanted for my uh, for my action button was only in the context menu because I don't want my boss to see that I can play alien invasion during uh, my work hours instead of managing his data center. So I don't want it to see it up there. So it's just in the context menu when you right click. And there is also, I'll show it in a second. There, in a second, there is also a new subtop that was created. Uh, again, in the data center scope to have, to show the score I have in protecting this data, data center from alien invasion. And I also asked um, to align it to the right. Uh, if you see in here, you see the space shooter score. Okay, this, my score is five. So the open dialogue function called the API show dialogue function gave a label of data center dot name under attack because uh, we, we give uh, the UI plugin infrastructure the, the, the details about the, the selected object. And we have some two buttons that we created in the dialogue, cheat and get me out of here. That also gives you a way to open a new dialogue but also get uh, uh, buttons that can get you back to the engine. These are these two buttons. And everything is an event in here, so I have uh, event registration. One of them is the UI init in order to initialize my plugin. And the other one is the selection change of the data center. So again, if I have one, uh, uh, one data center that is selected, then I have a subtab for it with the score and etc. If I have more than one, then the subtab is not accessible because, uh, because when you select more than one a data center, no subtab is, uh, should be accessible. And we talked about the message received, um, the message received uh, event. That's the event that is used in order to exchange messages between uh, the, 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 the plugin itself and the infrastructure. So I have here several events, game init, game win, and, uh, and get score. Again, when I, when I cheated, I just uh, uh, posted the game win message to the parent. The parent is the, uh, is, is the UI plugin. And I called API.ready at the end to tell the Overt engine that it can start initializing my plugin. Very simple plugin, very simple API, allows you to, to, to add uh, basically buttons and, and tabs, main tabs and sub tabs in every part of the engine. Um, again, I should, I told you about the NetApp example. I show here another example of a, a plugin I wrote for Foreman. Basically, uh, what we did there is um, we allowed, we added a Foreman dashboard tab. My environment was pretty dead, so we don't see a lot of events here. But if you know Foreman, it has a dashboard, and you can just access the URL of the dashboard to see details. So in here, I created a main tab that just directs you to a URL. 
uh, uh, in this plugin, I also had uh, to write something in the foreman side to do some more embeddable view of the dashboard, but I won't get into that. Now, when I'm in the virtual machine's main tab and I select a virtual machine that, uh, uh, that foreman is aware of, I can see here details taken from foreman, different details on the VM, different uh, activity graphs, and stuff like that. Um, again, so I'll show the code for that later on, but you understand here that I have a new main tab, so, you add, so I use the add main tab action. Um, I have a new uh, sub tab in here for form and details, and I have a, a VM selection changed event in order to change the URL that, I, that I'm showing in the sub tab according to the VM that I selected. And if I selected more than one VM, then the sub tab is irrelevant. So, is the flow clear? So that's another use case. Uh, so again, the, uh, as I said, add the subtab. I added two subtabs here, one for details and one for graphs. Um, I created a helper function to hide or show the, the, the subtabs. Not really important in that matter. And I added a new main tab to contact the dashboard. Now in order to, uh, uh, I used also a configuration of the plugin in order to, to contain the URL of the foreman uh, server I'm working with. So just uh, a good use of the configuration. What we wanted to do here is to, to use some single sign-on uh, operation between uh, foreman and the over engine. So when uh, we use the, f the, the REST API session in order to do that, so when the uh, the session acquired event was triggered. I knew the plugin code knew that there is a new session, and then it, 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 it issued a login to Foreman. Uh, I, I also needed to add some code in the Foreman side in order to support the single sign on operation. Basically, it took the session ID and verified it with the overtension. As simple as that. I won't get into the Foreman side, but just to show you a use case. Another use case that you can use the REST API session with. Uh, the other use case is to, to use it in order to do stuff. Uh, in here, I only use that in order to, do, uh, to verify that the user is indeed logged in and that the session is, is indeed valid uh, in the system. <coughs> and in the VM, sorry. And in the virtual machine select a change event, uh, what I did here is I checked whether one VM is selected or more, and if one VM was selected, I, I uh, contacted, uh, I reached Foreman to check whether he is aware of this VM or not, because the, the VM can be, uh, perhaps it was created not through Foreman. So if it's created through Foreman and Foreman is aware of that, then I will show the subtabs. If it's not created through Foreman, then the subtabs won't be visible. And when the user logs out, in the user logout event, I also logged out from Foreman. That's, uh, so this is the function that hides and shows the, the subtabs, not really important, uh, but uh, uh, the only important part here is that we, I changed the subtab content URL according to the name of the, of the selected VM. In here. I see you, api.set tab content URL. So uh, th this function is called in case that the VM was, was found as a host in Foreman. So I construct the URL and I set the subtab URL. So when you press the subtab, you will get to the proper URL in Foreman. Is that uh, clear? Another thing I wanted to mention is that we added a new feature to allow you to uh, um, Let's show the UI for a second. In our UI, we have an events subtab in order to show different events that happened in the system re that relates to the specific entity. We added the ability to, to inject external events into the engine. So what you would do as a plugin that, that, that creates, for example, let's take again the NetApp example because I think it's a good one. Uh, uh, you created a new volume. So, so when you press the button, um, the NetApp can say, okay, 
I started to create a new volume in my filer and to give the exact details, and that would be added as an event to the overt engine. Then it can create it, then when it finished creating, it can send an event, it can add an external event saying the volume was created successfully. Now I'm gonna start creating the storage domain connected to the volume. So it, 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 gave, it gives you a way to, to do even a more deeply, deep integration so the administrator knows what's happening right now. It's not, he didn't just press a button, he knows that the, the volume uh, is, is now, uh, is now uh, um, uh, the creation of the volume is now in progress, he knows that the creation failed or succeeded, uh, and it's not just a, you know, a black box that he doesn't uh, know what's the status of, of things that are happening. So it's also powerful because you can, as an administrator using the, this, this system, you can, you can be aware of what's happening in your environment. So uh, that's a new addition in 3.3, I think, right? Yeah. I think only 3.3, yeah. Any questions on the plugin, UI plugins? Okay, there are, there are a few other examples in our website. Um, one of the nice plugins that, that's, that uh, a guy, I don't remember his name, but he works at a company called Ovido, which is funny because I'm Oved O, Oved Ufali, so and people tend to confuse uh, 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 the two of us. So anyway, he created a plugin that works with uh, um, uh, Nagius, right, I forgot about it. Um, in order to, to, to show you different statistics on your, 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 on your VNs, on your hosts, and etc., it's a, it's, a, it's a great plugin. Uh, you should try install it and use it, and also see it as an example. If, you, if you're interested in writing a plugin, it did some more complex stuff than I did here in these examples. Okay, so uh, uh, moving along to the, uh, to the next feature, which is the scheduling API feature. So that's an email we got uh, from one of the users. He wanted to define the maximum number of running VMs on the host. Okay, we didn't give him the way to do that. Um, so the scheduling mechanism we had so far was based on a, a distribution algorithm that was defined on the cluster. One of them it was, uh, we had two policies basically on the cluster. One of them, one of them is ev evenly distributed in order to evenly distribute the VMs around the hosts. And the other one was power saving in order to do the exact uh, opposite, to use uh, to not, that in off-peak hours to, to not to use uh, all the hosts, uh, that some hosts can be uh, even shut down if it needs to. So basically these were the policies and the scheduling uh, mechanism, which, is, uh, which basically says I would like to run, to run this VM, uh, um, used one of, these, um, one of these policies in order to decide where the VM should run. We also, have, we also had a load balancing mechanism that we, uh, uh, um, in a specific point in time, periodically, we, we ran the load balancer and we asked him, okay, do we have here a VM that needs to be migrated to another host in order to be more compliant with the policy? For example, if we are in, a, in evenly distributed policy and we have one host that's running a lot of VMs, then perhaps we will try to migrate VMs from this host to other hosts in the system. So we only had two distribution algorithms, taking into consideration only CPU usage, basically. And we didn't give you any way to construct your own policy. So the new scheduling mechanism, again introduced in, in over 3.3, gives you a way to do that. Uh, through several mechanisms. One of them is a, a filter module. Filter module basically, as you see in the slide, uh, uh, allows you to filter out hosts uh, uh, that you don't want the VM to run, uh, that you don't want the VM to run on for that reason or another. Uh, for example, I started with four hosts. For the first filter, filtered out host number three, and the second one uh, uh, filtered uh, host number one as well, and so I was left with two hosts that are available to run my VM. Now I can do any logic I want. I can say I have a specific network uh, uh, 
network infrastructure I need on this on the host running this specific VM, and I'm aware of that because I'm I'm uh, in my environment I have something special about them. So I can write a new filter saying uh, if the host is one of these uh, and has this capability, then I can run this VM. And for another VM, maybe th this condition is irrelevant. Uh, so the filter models, uh, module allows me to do that. The other module is the weight module, which allows you, once you have a, a, a set of, a, a white list of hosts that can run the VM, you want to, to choose the best one, uh, the, the one that fits best in order to, uh, uh, according to some weight module uh, um, that you have. So again, you can have more than one weight module and eventually you will get uh, the weight of the host. The, the lower the weight is, uh, the, the more chances this host will be selected as the one running the VM. So again, the filter module, easy to write and maintain. It's chained up. We have a filter chain in, the, in there. Um, we can add uh, custom parameters. Uh, existing logic that we had in the system, when you create a new uh, VM, you, you can pin it to host. For example, we added a new, uh, uh, once we added this infrastructure, we added a new filter to do that internally in the system. Um, and we also added the ability to write new uh, external filters in Python um, and that can be loaded into the engine. So if I'm going back to the example, I would like to, to, to uh, define the maximum number of running VMs on the host. Then I want my filter to filter out hosts that are running more than three VMs. So I create a, a Python class called maxVMs. I have a do filter function over here uh, 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 that gets the, the host IDs. These are the IDs of the hosts that are available for now for me to run the VM on and the VM ID. And I have here some arguments. Uh, for example, the maximum number of VMs uh, uh, is, an, is, is an argument that I get as an input in here. So what I need to do, basically, uh, if you don't look at the code for a second, what I need to do is to, is to go over all the hosts, uh, um, identify the ones running more than the maximum uh, number of VMs or, or, or the, the maximum itself, and filter them out. That's the only thing I need to do. So I use the API in order to do that. I construct, uh, 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 like we saw earlier in the SDK section, I construct a connection to the API, giving the username, the password, and the URL. Um, and we query for the hosts. Again, we, do, we go to the hosts collection, asking to list hosts, and to choose only, ho only hosts that are in the list of host ID, with, a, with an ID that is uh, from the host IDs I got as an input. And then I'm going on the then I'm going over the hosts one by one, and I'm checking whether the number of active VMs on the host is smaller than the maximum. If it is, then I can use these hosts in order to run the VM. If it's not, then I can't. So this function basically filters out uh, uh, VMs, that, a host that can't, that have more than 100 VMs uh, in this part, in, in, this, in this case. Am I clear? The, the Python SDK. This is Python. Yeah, yeah. It's using the Python SDK to do that. The only thing uh, I found a bit, uh, uh, just being honest with you, because when I prepared the slides here, I, I saw that something, um, I didn't write this feature, the scheduling API. And what bothered me here most is that you need to pass the username and the password, etc., in order to, to do that. Um, and you saw a second ago the solution we had for UI plugins that we gave you some rest session. So perhaps we would do that uh, in here as well to give you some uh, session. The only difference is that for the UI plugins, you really logged into the system. This one is a periodic, uh, uh, it's both periodic or, uh, um, or user generated event depending on, on whether you're load balancing or running a new VM but perhaps we would, it would be nice to give a session ID in here as well. 
But why are you, you going to ask something? Because I. Uh, that's okay? I think it's. Uh, I think it 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 looks for for different classes that have the do filter function when it when it scans for the directory. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I mean, uh, um, that I think that's the case, but um, perhaps it's enough. For yes. So the events. Uh, I will get there, but. But basically, what will trigger the filter? The, the filter will be triggered in, in, in a few use cases. One of them is uh, uh, just you decide to run the VM. Okay, so you go to the uh, or to the API or the CLI or the SDK or the WebAdmin or the user portal, whatever you want, and you press play on the VM. You say, I would like to run this VM. So that would call the overage scheduler and ask him to, to, to select a host to write. It to run the VM on, okay? So the first thing it would do is, is it, he, it would check what available hosts are in the cluster, okay? Uh, available hosts are hosts that are in an up state, and that would be the, the, the big list of hosts, okay? Now all the filters start running one by one. And each filter can filter out hosts until we're left with a, a smaller set of hosts that the wait function. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. One use case, yeah. but I might want to trigger the filter in a number of cases, maybe a hardware failure, uh, time of the day, I don't know. Uh, so, so, perhaps, so, so perhaps a hardware failure may, uh, may cause a migration to work, and the filter will work in migration as well. You, you, can't, uh, you can't trigger that. that it triggers only when the regular scheduler would have triggered. Okay. Uh, um, load balancing is another example that periodically we check if we need to, to migrate a VM, so it will be triggered as well. Um, you would basically trigger, a, a, in the case you're, you're representing, perhaps you will have a script that triggers a VM migration event, and the VM migration event will eventually trigger that. But you won't trigger that directly, you will just trigger migration and that will happen. Okay, so, so that's the filter. Now, assuming I'm left with, with several hosts, I have the wait module. Uh, again, the lower the better. We, we use the current uh, policies we have for evenly distributed and power saving, and we created a, a wait module for them. I won't get into that, but you can create external wait modules in Python again. So. Uh, so in this example, I show the uh, event, uh, the evenly uh, distribution. So what we do here again is we have a class with the do score function, getting the host IDs and the VM IDs. These are the hosts that were left after all the filters ran. Okay, these are host, host two and host four in our example. And I get the VM ID. That's the VM that I want to, uh, uh, to, to, to run or to migrate depending on the use case. And, and what, uh, what we're going to do here is uh, uh, um, add, is, is getting the number of active VM, VMs on, on, on each host and adding that to the, score, uh, to the score set we're returning back. So I would add the host ID and the, uh, and the weight will be the number of active VMs. So in that case, the, the, the host with the best score will be the host running uh, the, the lowest number of VMs. And if I want to be evenly distributed, I should run the VM on that host. Uh, so that's what, that's what this wait function does here. Again, you need to access the, uh, the API in here in order to get the details. Uh, now, the reason we don't expose everything in here, only the host IDs, is, in order, uh, is because you can have a lot of, a lot of hosts that can run the, that are in input in here, but maybe you don't want to get the details on all of them. It depends on what you already know. So, uh, so that's just an optimization in here that to give you the IDs. Uh, it also keeps the API in here a bit cleaner, even if in the, if in the future you will have, 
will have uh, other properties and etc you will have you get an id and that's it and the third uh, the third part in here is is uh, a load balancing that uh, periodically runs um, and determines whether a vm should be migrated now in my environment and again we had uh, uh, we had two uh, uh, load balancing algorithms evenly distributed and power saving and we created uh, uh, two predefined uh, load balancing policies for that um, and in here what we what we basically do in the load balancer is we check what if we have in here uh, we run on all the hosts and we check uh, um, if the number of active VMs on the host is smaller than the maximum. If that's the case, then we the, then the host is 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 in uh, the whitelist. Um, if that's not the case, then perhaps we have here an overloaded host. So we save that host uh, for later on. So um, what happens what happens eventually is that if we didn't find an overloaded host, then we don't need to do any migration at all because. Uh, um, because no host is overloaded, all all the uh, everything is okay. We don't need to to do anything. But if we found a, a specific host that that is overloaded, which means it has more than the maximum number of VMs, then we pick a VM and we say, please migrate this VM to one of these whitelist hosts. The whitelist host is the the host that have. Uh, less than uh, the maximum number of VMs running. So if I have, for example, one host that's running 102 VMs and three hosts that are running uh, 90 VMs, then I will choose, uh, uh, then I will put the host running 90 VMs in my whitelist and I will choose one VM running on the overloaded host and say, please migrate this, ho this VM to one of these hosts. Okay, uh, is it clear? What? When you select the host, okay, you have a white you, list. You, it's, it's a list of. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so, so later on it will choose one of the hosts. I mean, it, this code runs after, uh, um, basically, after that it will run filters and it will run weights. So it's just it's just the, the initial phase to just to sell, just to choose uh, this the input here will be passed to the filters and then to the weight and then a host will be selected. So as I said, you can write external policy units. Um, you you place them in user shell, obvious schedule, or proxy plugins, and we analyze for filter, weight, or balance functions. We cache the results and we export that um, in the UI. So here is here is the uh, the UI for that. Um, we we you can add or edit a cluster policy, and in that you can um, enable different filters. Now some of the filters, as you see here, like CPU and network, are predefined filters, and there is here uh, max vms the max vms filter i showed you earlier that was enabled it's just you just drag and drop filters into this policy then on the second section you have weight modules and you drag and drop different uh, weights into that again you can you see here ext is stands for external uh, weight functions and you see the predefined ones in here as well and you select one load balancer uh, for each policy. In here, because we use the, the max uh, VMs uh, filter, we have here a, par a property called maximum VM count that needs to be configured for this cluster policy. So that's the first, the first part, creating a new cluster policy. And then, um, if you go to the cluster, it's hard to see in here, but the cluster main tab and you select a cluster, you can edit the cluster policy, selecting the policy that we created a second ago, and you can, uh, uh, you can uh, override the, this uh, property from the default that was created in the cluster policy. 
that's a way for you to apply uh, the cluster policy um, uh, in, in your specific cluster. So that will eventually tell what filters will run, what wave functions will run, and what load balancer logic will, will run. It's a very powerful feature, depends if you need that. Uh, any questions so far? So bear with me a few more minutes and, and we're over. I know it's a long session, so. Uh, um, so uh, the, the next part, we'll talk about VDSM hooks. Uh, the VDSM hooks is, is a pretty, uh, yeah, I would say old, but uh, it's a feature that's been there for, for, from the, the beginning. So uh, UI plugins appeared a year and a half ago and the scheduling API is just uh, straight from the oven. Um, you have here links to explanation on the VDSM hooks and also a catalog of hooks. Basically, a hooks is a, a mechanism to, to customize, uh, uh, to do different customization. Um, it allows you as an administrator to define scripts that modify um, a VM operation, modify things on the host running the VM, um, like modifying the VM configuration, running system scripts, um, in here you see that the, we have VDSM and when we create a new VM, when we would like to run a new VM and we select the host, we eventually get to VDSM telling him, please create the VM on the host. And VDSM uh, uh, um, calls libvirt in order to do that. But in between the call to libvirt, you can write a hook to modify the VM just before it gets to, to, to libvirt. Um, and you can do also specific operations in the hook that don't change the VM. If you want to write something to a log or if we would like to, to add some entry in the IP tables for that specific VM, you can do that. So hook scripts are called at specific VM lifecycle events. Uh, as I said, they can modify the VM or apply a specific rule or run any command you want. So the different lifecycle events you can use is uh, um, when VDSM starts, before and after the VM starts, before migration event, before you pause the VM, before you hibernate the VM, continue, uh, when you stop the VM. For example, if you created a new IP table entry when the VM, uh, when you ran the VM, maybe when you stop it, you want to delete this entry. So you would use both the before VM start and on VM stop. You can also hook to uh, hot plugging before you hot plug and leak and after you hot plug and leak, I think for, for disk as well, mention that. So when you stand on, VM, uh, on a specific VM, you see they selected the virtual machine here, main tab and selected a specific virtual machine. You go to the custom properties uh, uh, side tab and in here you see the different hooks that are uh, available uh, for this VM, and you can uh, pass different parameters to them. I'll skip uh, this slide for a second. This is an example of a hook. Um, what this hook does is add a, 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 a watchdog device. It's basically um, a device that identifies something wrong happened to the VM, and if, if the VM crashed, it can do a specific operation. In here, we decided that we uh, do a reset uh, action. So I think that now we have the watchdog support already inside the overt engine, but before we had this support, people, people said we want to use that. Why can't you allow us to use that? So an easy way to, to add this functionality is to tell them or to write a hook by ourselves, just write a hook. What the hook does, it's, it, 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 it takes the, uh, uh, the domain XML of the VM. That's the XML that VDSM created in order to pass it to libvirt to run the VM. We get the devices section and we create a new element in the devices section to add the new watchdog device, telling him I would like to have the, uh, the reset action. And we add it to the devices uh, XML and we write the domain XML. So basically what we did here 
is uh, uh, we took the XML, added the device, saved the XML, and then that's the XML that will be best delivered. That's it, and we have support. No need to add a UI for that, no need to add the engine code for that, only, uh, only add the hook and configure that in the VM custom properties. No, you need to put the hook uh, manually on the hosts relevant for that, uh, for and that hook. The, and if the VM migrates to another host? Then, then uh, when the VM migrates, you don't really, uh, you, have, uh, you have a before after VM migration event. Uh, so if, in case of migration, the domain XML doesn't change unless you, I don't, I'm not sure you can change that, Omer, perhaps you know? Sorry. You can change the domain XML on VM migration. In this case, you won't need to, by the way, because the domain XML contains the device, but just... Uh, no, I mean, if, uh, if the VM migrates to another host, it doesn't have the proper hook. Yeah. No, but it doesn't need the hook. In, the, in, in this case, it doesn't really need the hook. No, yeah. In this case, yeah, in this case. In other cases, if, if it needs the hook, then you need to put it there, and you would probably hook to the uh, before migration, after migration, and you see it's before VM migration in or out, so in the source or the destination hooks. Okay, so you would the, need to... the hooks are all uh, deployed and deleted manually. In there? All the hooks yeah. are deployed and uh, deleted and modified manually. They are, they, are, they are not managed by the end. Yeah, we're not, uh, as far as I know, we can't really... I'm not sure about the host. We, we do have host deployed, but I'm not sure which handles. Yeah, I don't think it has... We, we do show you that in the UI. Um, no, it's here. Okay, in the host subtab, you can see the hooks that are on the host. So you can easily see if the, the hooks are there, but you can't really add new hooks to the, okay. yeah. The, the, I think the main use case for hooks, I see several ones. One of them is that someone wants a feature and it's not available yet. You use a hook for now, in the future it will, it will be supported. Another use case is that perhaps you, as a, as a third party, uh, you, you use, for example, I know Melanox, for example, I don't know if you know this company, used uh, hooks in order to, to add NICs, InfiniBand NICs into the VM because we didn't have this functionality. If I remember correctly, that's why they, what they did. So basically, they wrote a hook. The, if you put the hook on all the hosts, then you have this functionality. Perhaps it, it, it can be added to the engine later on as, as a native uh, feature if, if, that's what, if that's what's needed and, uh, and, and if it's decided in the community that that's going to be in a part of, of a specific version. Uh, but until then, it can be available as a hook. So, so sometimes hook eventually get to be a feature, sometimes not. So um, you can also, I'm, I'm not sure, it would be nice to test uh, whether we show the hooks through the API. I'm not sure about that, the available hooks. Because if we do, then you can write a, 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 a filter that filters out if you know a specific VM needs the hook, and so you can get the host, get the different hooks, and then see whether, it's, uh, whether the hook is in the host. Uh, that case, you can verify that the VM won't run on a, on a host that doesn't have the hook. But I'm not sure we expose this information. That the hook ran? No, you, you won't see an event that the uh, hook ran. Not as far as I know. It's strictly a, a VDSM feature that allows you to, uh, to do that. The engine just passes the, the properties so that if, if you see that, uh, I don't know, that the watchdog uh, property 
was ad was added when you created a VM, then the uh, then the hook will uh, you see a, a condition on the hook uh, if has key watchdog. If you want to pass the watchdog key, it won't run. Yeah, yeah. So all the hooks all the hooks will run, but they will each hook needs to test whether it needs to be activated. Yeah. 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 No, uh, no. You can do it, uh, <laughs> just uh, maybe abusing some of the functionality, but you can use uh, the REST SDK in order to push an external event that the hook was triggered, for yeah, example. Right. Yeah, but it's, not, uh, uh, but it's not something that's there natively. Again, I'm not sure that the hooks are uh, uh, reported at the host. I think not, but I'm not sure they about it. They are what? Ah, so you have subtype, you have uh, hooks of collection. Ah, okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, so in that case, you can use a filter for it. You can use a filter, and the filter, by the way, can can put. Uh, uh, it will filter our host. Maybe you can also trigger some warning uh, somewhere, uh, an event saying that there, there is a failure uh, that you would have expected the host to have the hook, but it doesn't have the hook. You can do a lot of things. With the combination of uh, hooks, of scheduling API, of using the SDK, you can do a lot of things, and, and uh, it depends how you want to, to use that. So hooks catalog, I won't go over that. That appears in the link I, I, I showed you uh, earlier. We have a lot of hooks. Some of these hooks uh, maybe uh, attach a LAN to a VM. We already have that as a feature, but before we had that as a feature, you could have done that using a hook. Uh, and a lot of others. These are my details, uh, my email address, ovedo at reddit.com. Uh, you can see me on the Overt IRC. I have a blog. Uh, currently, it has um, several entries, not, not a lot, unfortunately. I need to do some more. But uh, about the Delta Cloud and about UI plugins. It has also other, the formal plugin, uh, was more difficult than, than, than it looks. It, it contained also a part uh, um, in the form, any, a plugin in Foreman as well. And there are a few things you need to consider when running a, play, a plugin, which is the, uh, the cross origin issue. Uh, um, I won't go into that, but the, the blog post gets into that. And uh, it's worth reading if you're interested in writing a new plugin. You have the users and the engine devel mailing list. Um, engine devel is mostly for developers. Users is most is mostly for for users uh, sharing their experience or or asking different questions. So you should usually use that one. Um, we'll just go to the over at IRC. Um, as I said earlier, going back in time, we have. Wasn't that smart, but uh, anyway, uh, we have these sessions. Uh, <laughs> Omer session about uh, integration with cloud in it tomorrow, and over developer day at the KVM forum, um, which is your stage to to let us know what you want to have in the product. Um, uh, any questions? Okay, so thank you for your patience. Hope you learned something new.